I don't think I have to be the one to tell you, but gaming is getting expensive. I, I, I see it online a lot where people are going, you know, it's getting so expensive. I'm just not able to participate in this hobby as much anymore. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. And that's sort of made me think a bit about maybe a series or at least now for now, one video where we look into different ways to get cheap gaming entertainment. Today, I wanted to look at how we can put together a cheap emulation box, like one that's less than a hundred dollars. So we'll say even the price of a brand new game nowadays, a Mario Kart game at 80 bucks even, but is able to play. I don't know, we'll go for the sixth generation of consoles, the GameCube, the PS2, and the Xbox, something they'll hook up to a nice big flat screen, look pretty good, and make these games run well, while keeping it in a pretty small form factor, maybe the size of a Wii. If that sounds interesting to you, stay tuned. We'll take a shot at this and see if we can make it all work out. And if you like this sort of a video, let me know, and I will attempt to turn it into a series where we think outside the box and come up with different ways to even put together systems like this. It's not always going to be pretty, but you know what? It'll hopefully by the end of it be very, very functional and a lot of fun. First, you should figure out exactly how far you need your emulation system to go, specifically which generations you're targeting. In my case, I was looking for a good experience up to the sixth generation, that being PS2, Xbox, GameCube, and you know, we'll even throw Dreamcast in there just for fun. It's a great generation with an incredible library of games and when cleaned up can still hold their own now. Good for nostalgia, obviously, but if you're a bit younger, don't discount some of these older titles. You might be surprised with some of the creativity from this time period. Also, it probably goes without saying, but if we're gonna get a system like this together to run sixth generation well, all the previous generations, for the most part, should also run really well then. So your PS1, N64, your Super Nintendo, Game Boy, Genesis, there shouldn't be any issues there. So while I will be focusing primarily on PS2, GameCube, Xbox, and even Dreamcast, just remember there's an entire list of games from massive libraries that would also run fine. All right, now that I have my targets figured out for what I want the system to do, it's time to go shopping over on eBay. It's pretty much the de facto place to go for used PC hardware. And after scrolling for a few minutes, I found what I think is a well-priced Dell Optiplex 7050. And look, I know what you're thinking, but give me, give me one minute to explain. There are a few things you can be sure of in life, death, taxes, and cheap office PCs flooding eBay every single week. With how technology has continued to advance and large office buildings constantly turning over and upgrading their systems, we can take advantage of a market that is shockingly full of little PCs that are pretty good at emulation. Now, there are a ton of configurations you'll come across while browsing online, so it may be difficult to find the exact configuration I have in this video, but let me go over a few things with why this one in particular caught my eye. First thing, it's cheap. At $55 with $10 shipping, it easily fits under the $100 mark, and it's almost turnkey as it is. Second thing, it's small, and minus the big Dell logo on the front, should work in a living room setting under the TV. And the third thing, the processor. Typically, I see low power variants of these desktop CPUs, and you can tell by the little T they have on the end. This one, however, appears to have the full power desktop version i5-7600. It's paired with onboard Iris 630, and and should handle emulation at 1080p well enough. I will need a charger, and that is a bit annoying since I need it to match up a 130 watt brick with the smaller, less common Dell charger tip. If you end up going down this path for an emulation box, double check the listing to make sure it has a charger included, as it'll save you an extra step in purchase later on. For the most part, these smaller office PCs with an i5 or better with an Intel HD, we'll say 500 and up, should get you similar results for what you see in this video. Just remember to not buy the first mini PC you come across on eBay since they get posted so frequently, there should be plenty to compare and choose from. Looking around the back on the system, there's plenty of USB ports and the most important part, an HDMI port. Some of these mini PCs only have display port out, so triple check that there is some sort of HDMI out on the back. Otherwise, you'll need to use a display port to HDMI cable. And even with that, it can introduce some annoying issues with compatibility for different TVs. There's also a chance that you might end up with a PC that doesn't have Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. If that happens, I'd recommend picking up a cheap USB adapter like this one online. You can wire it in through LAN to connect online, but you'll want Bluetooth for more controller options, so it's definitely 
definitely worth getting. I did want to change one thing with this PC real quick, which leads me to another benefit of these small office computers. They're pretty easy to work on. Here it's one screw in the back and the top slides off. Now we can see everything right away, including additional slots for storage expansion and towards the front are RAM. I wanted to add another stick to bring the total to 16 gigabytes, but more importantly, to take advantage of dual channel memory. Eight gigabytes of DDR4 doesn't cost much and at right around $15 or less for the upgrade, completely worth it. I also changed out the thermal compound on the CPU since I figured it still had the factory paste on it and did a quick cleaning of the fan. Again, all easy stuff with everything accessible once the lid is removed. Well, that's basically it for the hardware side. The PC itself has seen better days with a major dent on the top and some of the front grill is broken and missing. I didn't say it would necessarily be a pretty looking emulation box. I'm sure there are more creative people than myself out there who could dress this up a bit better with 3D prints and paint, but I'm just looking for functionality today. Now for the front end, I'm going to go with Batacera, which is just a really well-known setup for retro games and they have all the stuff listed here many of the benefits the features uh it plug and play free and open source but also there's a ton of documentation and a lot of know-how and troubleshooting around this people have gone through a lot with this on many different devices especially if you look at the download page you can see all the stuff that it is compatible with and while i'm going to be downloading just for like desktop pc and laptop i mean there is a wide range of devices that this will work for all i really need to do though is download the the image that they have on the website the newest one flash it to a usb stick plug it in and we should be able to load it up. While you can just boot from the USB stick, I decided to install Batacera to the internal SSD to complete the system. This way, it'll boot without a flash drive being needed. From here, I set up the emulators, installed any updates, moved over games, and dressed things up a bit with cover art. I'm not gonna go too in depth for how to set up Batacera here, but there are a ton of tutorials online that can walk you through a lot of this stuff. Fortunately, it's all pretty easy, and because it's such a popular front end, most times, if you have an issue, you, there's probably a person who already asked how to fix it in a forum post somewhere that'll come up in Google. But I'll leave a link down below in the description for a video that specifically goes over the Batacera install for a PC like this one. Anyway, with all this done, let's take a look at how the system is in real time when it starts up. The interface for Batacera, when you have it set up, looks awesome in a living room setting. Easy to navigate menu, big images for each console, and a grid-based layout for all the different games in each category. I'm using this 8-bit Doe controller that I saw on sale for like $28 on Amazon. It's the Black Myth Wukong themed one. Latency is good as it uses 2.4 gigahertz USB dongle that I have plugged into the back of the PC. Keep in mind, with Bluetooth, you can use a ton of different controllers from Xbox, PlayStation, and Nintendo all have compatible input devices. Let's start with what should be the easiest system to run on this PC, the Dreamcast. For all these consoles you'll see in this video, I'm setting the internal resolution to a 2x, giving us a smoother looking image. Higher end systems can do higher internal resolutions and even push 4K, but for this one, I found these settings give a nice balance of visuals and performance. That said, the Dreamcast is one that can probably get bumped up a bit more since it has no real issues delivering in games like Crazy Taxi or Sonic Adventure 2. The Dreamcast also has visuals that really clean up well here and looks great in motion. You'll see this box here at the bottom left of the screen that displays performance details along with the name of the game being played. Figured I'd leave it up despite it taking a portion of the screen so you can see any frame rate flux fluctuations as we go. Okay, now onto the big three that I wanted to focus on for this build, the GameCube, PS2, and Xbox. We'll go to the GameCube first here, and Dolphin really shows just how good of an emulator it is with lower end systems. I really didn't have many issues with games running at 60 FPS majority of the time. Beautiful Joe, still a very, very unique game that's a blast to play, and Sega Soccer Slam, it's one of those hidden gems that I don't think enough people know about. 
Rogue Leader is usually a benchmark title for people to try out, and you can see why, with the opening minute or so showing frame drops as turrets were exploding all over the place, eventually a lot of the hitching and drops stopped and it ran well. The biggest problem that'll come up here is if you're not using a GameCube controller, button placement and mapping is going to be needed, and even then, it'll probably be pretty awkward. Really, I'd recommend if you want to play a lot of GameCube games with an emulation system like this, probably get a third party GameCube controller or get the Wii U USB to GameCube adapter and just plug a bunch of them in that way. The PS2 is next on the list and is certainly harder to run than GameCube through emulation. Typically, it seems to beat up the CPU side pretty good, but here the i5 actually holds up well. Need for Speed Underground 2 is an absolute classic and ran at a consistent 60 FPS, even when crashing into things or multiple cars were on screen. The car selection from early 2000s, along with the soundtrack, it's peak time capsule need for speed. Here Comes the Pain is, I think, the best wrestling game ever made. Controversial opinion, I know, but at the very least, it, it's gotta be top three, right? Well, it runs just about perfect here with the SmackDown finisher animation causing zero slowdown, which was something I would notice in the past on other builds. Yes, I gave myself full finishers as The Undertaker for testing purposes, and just to lay into Charlie Haas with choke slams. God of War 2 is a similar benchmark game like we have with Rogue Leader on the GameCube, but here for obviously the PS2. And it also performed well, but I did notice at times you would see drops into the 45 to 50 FPS range. And it just ends up being a game that does stress the emulator and the system itself. But for the most part, I'd say 90% of the time it ran in the 50 to 60 FPS range and was very responsive the whole way through. And you know what? It still looks really, really good, especially that 2X rendering. Oh, and last thing for the PS2, Path of Neo works, but has some weird screen tearing thing going on. I wanted to bring it up because it's probably something that's fixable with some tweaks in the settings, and it's worth figuring out since this is a game I think more Matrix fans should play. Seriously, I started it up just to capture footage. I ended up going an hour and a half or so in before I had to stop myself because I, I just think it's a very, very fun game. See, we got Enter the Matrix at the beginning of the generation, but you didn't get to play as Neo, and that's what we wanted to do in a video video game with the Matrix. Towards the end of the generation, we did get Path of Neo, and that finally gave us the chance to be the one. And this game really made you feel powerful the further in you went. Check it out if you get a chance, and certainly if you're a Matrix fan. The system I have the least amount of confidence in emulating is last, and that's the original Xbox. The other two consoles have a pretty long history around emulation, but I feel like the Xbox has been a more recent thing, so I wasn't expecting a lot from it. What I got, though, was pretty good, all things considered. Now, some games wouldn't even start, like Burnout or NFL Fever, but others did, like Tony Hawk 2X, which ran really well with the 2X resolution bump. Oh, yeah. If you play Tony Hawk on the Xbox, 2X that is, please turn off the motion blur in the settings. I don't know whose idea it was to turn that on by default, but it is disgusting. Jet Set Radio Future saw a solid 60 FPS as I skated around in the starting area, and Halo turned in a solid performance bouncing around in the 50s. That is, unless you zoom in with the pistol, the frame rate absolutely plummets when you do that. The funny thing is, I bet the PC version of Halo would run fine on this PC, and maybe that's worth doing in the future just to see how it fares. All in all, this little PC does pretty well with the sixth generation, especially when taking the price into account. With some cleanup and customization, it would certainly fit in well for any entertainment center. You do need a keyboard and mouse for initial installation and moving files around, but after all of that is done, it, it really does act like a little console. Even plugging it in, it's really just the power cable and HDMI for how I had it set up, and it was off and running. As I mentioned earlier, these PCs are all over eBay, and after checking again, even this Dell Optiplex 7050 with the i5-7600 isn't exactly hard to find. You'd probably be able to do some light PC gaming with this setup as well, especially if you stick to older titles or less demanding indie games, and Steam certainly has plenty of those. Still, hopefully this video at least gave you an idea on one way you can think outside the box and repurpose older tech to save money for a cheap little emulation box. Let me know down in the comments if you want videos like this exploring other builds or even cheap consoles that can be modified to do more. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.